Support for Conversations Live comes from the Gertrude J. Sant Endowment, the James H. Olay Family Endowment, and the Sidney and Helen S. Friedman Endowment. And from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to WPSU's Conversations Live. I'm Carolyn Donaldson, coming to you live from the Dr. Keiko Miwo Ross WPSU Production Studio tonight. I hope you're safe and well. And with today's news, we have a lot to discuss tonight. But as the older adult population grows, it's no wonder aging is an increasing concern for many people. What are the different aspects of aging? What is the mental and physical toll? And what control do we have over our own aging process? We're going to cover these questions and more with a panel of experts joining us tonight. And we hope you join us and join in with the conversation. First, Marty Slowinski is a professor of human development and family studies at Penn State. He's also the director of the Center for Healthy Aging at Penn State. His research focuses on aging and health, including cognition, dementia, risk, stress, and emotion regulation. Amy Lorick is an assistant research professor also at the Center for Healthy Aging at Penn State, and her research focuses on the psychological and sociological processes related to successful healthy aging. And Mary Raffetto is a registered dietitian at the James E. Van Zant VA Medical Center based in Altoona. Now, the VA Center has outpatient clinics also in Dubois, Huntington, Indiana, Johnstown and State College and serves all of the veterans from our region. Now you can join us too in tonight's conversation. This is why we're here. We want to hear from you. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242 and call during the next hour. And our email address is connect at wpsu.org. That's if you feel more comfortable typing it up and sending it to us, we'll try to get that question answered as well. So let's begin the conversation. Now, healthy aging. It's actually a concept that all of us need to embrace throughout our lifespan, not just people with gray hair like me, as I volunteered to host this, knowing that I needed to learn more about this topic, because really, we're aging through our lives, and we can do it very healthy and very um, proactively, as we'll discuss tonight. So I want to start with that really general question, I guess, from our different guests, and just from that higher level thinking, what is healthy aging to you? Marty, let's start with you. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, when, when I teach healthy aging to undergraduates and begin to get them to encourage them to think about what their future is going to look like, um, we try and talk about the different kinds of challenges and the different kinds of changes people experience throughout their lives. So to me, healthy aging is balancing, uh, finding a balance to where you can um, sort of maximize the growth that you experience throughout adulthood and find ways to compensate for some of the things that, that um, decline a little bit as we get older. Good point. Mary, I'm gonna to turn to you next with your population that you serve and the veterans uh, in our region and their caregivers and family members. Thank you. So healthy aging to me as a dietitian. so just to give you a little bit of an idea, 65% uh, of our veteran population that we serve is over the age of 65. So this is something that we deal with day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And healthy aging to me, from a dietitian standpoint, is really eating for health and preserving preserving your body and nourishing it with, with good food that is really going to serve you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you want to treat yourself. You, I'm not telling, I would never tell you not to ever have cake again or anything like that. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> but you do want to learn how to properly nourish your body and nourish yourself for any type of diseases that may arise, such as diabetes or heart disease. Okay. And Amy, you're on the front lines in community engagement with all sorts of people of all ages. So what? how do you define healthy aging when you're out in our communities? Well, healthy aging is, I think, something that we um, we learn to embrace as we get older. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, early on, I think there's a little bit of fear 
with it because they see it happening in others. So for me, healthy aging is really about embracing one's own aging experience, but also in uh, learning, taking the opportunity to learn from others and recognize role models um, and continue to sort of seek out interactions for, uh, for the benefit of, of really yourself, but also for, for the other. All right. Very interesting. Well, to start the conversation, we're going to start with a few statistics. And Marty, you brought with us a couple of graphics, too, and Amy that kind of tell our story, because in Pennsylvania, we all need to start embracing healthy aging, right? We've got a lot of us out there. Yeah, Pennsylvania, depending how you count it, is one of the oldest states in the United States, the fifth oldest state. Uh, the number of people over the age of 65 is increasing rapidly. And what's interesting is in the United States, we're rapidly approaching uh, what I call a cultural tipping point. For the first time in the history of, of our country and in, in, in the history of the world, the number mm -hmm. of people over the age of 65 will outnumber uh, people under the age of 18. And this is um, not just a demographic uh, change, but this is a, a reshaping of our culture, our society, and our population in a way that, that we're really quite not, as a, as a society, prepared to deal with. Okay. Very interesting. And, and just even using the term of, of aging and using those terms that are perhaps we're using or misusing, elderly, aging, old people, you know, what should and shouldn't we be saying when we define our, our, our new lifestyles and our aging lifestyles? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, an interesting question as well. Um, it, when, when I uh, try to use labels or when we have to use labels to categorize people, I think a good practice always to put the people first. So when, when we refer to this process or, or this phenomena, uh, it's fine to say older, older adults, um, okay. people who are over the age 65. Okay. Um, and it is important how we, 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 we talk about and envision uh, this process. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Now, remember, we want to hear from you folks. So if you're watching this show, please give us a call. The number there you see on your screen, 1-800-543-8242. We want to get as many people calling and as many questions answered. I have lots in my head, in my gray old hair head, but I'd love to hear from you folks out there, too. So let's let's start, too, with anyone on the panel here to talk about the, the topics that people are asking most about. When they when you go out to present a program, Amy, or, or Mary, when you're making a presentation, at one of your clinics or your outpatient centers, um, you know, what, what are some of those topics that, that are brought to light with, with reference to healthy aging? I can jump in there. Okay. One, one of the, well, there, there are, the orientation of most people is what can I do? Okay. And so we try to um, offer a variety of ways for people to take more control over their experiences. And um, this can encompass many things. It's everything, and Mary can speak to this, um, what we eat, um, moving. Uh, it's also about learning new things or interacting with others. So you see on your screen, there are some pillars of brain health and Marty can talk more about brain health in particular, but these are all things we can be doing um, at every age, but are especially important as we get older. Okay. And let's Let's delve a little bit deeper into the brain health because there's some exciting news that your center has just released and that you're going to be doing a consortium to even learn more about better brain health. Right, Marty? Yeah. Um, Penn State has just recently announced um, support for a Geroscience and Dementia Prevention Consortium which is going to involve uh, a major investment in scientific efforts to try to understand the root causes of neurodegenerative diseases and identify strategies that people can use to prevent, slow, or delay them. Great. And I know that the Veterans Affairs, the Department of Veterans Affairs, under which you operate, Mary, have always taken a hard look at this because that's your, that's your demographics, right? Your veterans that you serve are absolutely in this category. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go back to that graphic, can we, on the six pillars. And Marty, can you do a little deeper dive into that brain health? Because uh, I'm there. Um, I wear hearing aids. I wear, uh, you know, contacts. I'm having a little bit of cognition issues. And I, I would assume some of our viewers are as well. So help us through some more of this. 
Yeah, it, it's a question that's on people's minds. Recent national surveys have uh, shown that nearly 50% of adults of all ages in the United States have some concern or even worry about keeping their brains healthy and staving off uh, dementia as, as they get older. And I understand that concern because as of right now, um, there are no approved therapeutics that uh, directly address the root cause of, of dementia um, and no effective preventive uh, treatments. But the good news and what's really interesting is that historically over the last few decades, the proportion of people over the age of 65 with dementia has been steadily decreasing by about 13% per decade. And that's good news because that shows that there are things that we can do as individuals and as collectively as a society that even in the absence of a medical breakthrough can help to promote our brain health um, and stave off dementia. And some of those um, uh, that you just saw on the, on the screen uh, a moment ago uh, showed some of those, those strategies that we can adopt. Diet is a very important okay. uh, consideration in this. All right, so let's move over to Mary. Before we get those calls, so please uh, do, uh, uh, while you're watching this, please think about a question that you might have for our panel. But Mary, you've brought along some really interesting things. Again, proactive, somewhat easy steps that we all can embrace and, and build into our diet. So walk us through um, maybe uh, some of those food and nutrition things that'll help us age healthy. Yes, absolutely. So we do have a graphic here of a sample plate on how a general healthy plate should look. We could pull that up. That'd be great. Okay. It's coming up there. Not right. There it is. Awesome. That you. looks that looks delicious <laughs> too. <laughs> yes, healthy eating can be good, right? Okay. Uh, so as you can see here, the top half of your plate, 50% of your plate should be comprised of non-starchy vegetables and fruit. So by non-starchy vegetables, I'm talking about your leafy greens, your peppers, onions, green beans, uh, broccoli and cauliflower, a couple others to name a few. And as we move down toward the bottom part of the plate, you'll see on the bottom, the bottom left-hand side, 25% of your plate should have should be comprised of starches or starchy vegetables. So by starchy vegetables, I mean your corn your potatoes, both white and sweet potatoes, and your legumes and your beans, such as navy beans, kidney beans, etc. Okay. Over on the bottom right here, you'll see 25% um, of your plate should be uh, lean protein. So here we have a chicken breast, but that could be that could be poultry, that could be fish, that could be red meat. We recommend if you do want to eat red meat, try to choose leaner cuts of red meat or even um, maybe 80, 20 at the highest for ground beef, 90, 10 or above is even better, um, just to reduce that cholesterol and saturated fat in your diet. Very interesting. And it, it really does break down easily that you can kind of break your plate up that way. I, I know that we used to say you know, like a fistful of protein, right? Just a little, like four ounces or something, however you want to define it. All right, so that's what we're supposed to eat. Let's keep going if it's okay with you folks out there. Let's look at what hydration, I, you know, as we age, I'll be honest, you know, we still want to be active and we'll talk about an active lifestyle, but you got to keep refreshing, right? Absolutely. Yes. So, um, hydration is very important as we age. So right here, we have a recommended uh, amount of water intake for men and women. Now this is very basic. So if you want a more specific measure of what you should have individually, I would recommend uh, talking to your doctor, meeting with a dietitian. Um, some good choices of hydration are your water, uh, fruit and vegetable juices are fine. If you're watching sodium and sugar, do be mindful of how many of those you're taking in. Milk is a great source of hydration, especially low fat and fat free milk and any other type of decaffeinated or herbal teas. Those are all gonna be sources of fluids that are going to hydrate you well. Now, as far as what to choose less often, notice I didn't say never, um, canned soups, yes, that's fluid, um, but it's also a hidden source of salt, which is going to pull that fluid off of you. Um, soft drinks and sports drinks, because they are so high in sugar, that's a very common misconception. A lot of people think sports drinks are very healthy and sure. they can be, and they have their time and place, absolutely. Caffeinated drinks, that's a big one. A lot of people think that they're very well hydrated because 
they drink a lot of coffee and quite honestly, coffee is going to do the exact opposite. It's going to act as a diuretic and cause you to actually excrete more fluid mm-hmm. and same with alcohol. Okay. Very interesting. And, and Marty or Amy, perhaps you want to comment on how important hydration is, especially for your brain health, right? It really, there's a definitive research that shows that connection between well hydration and cognition. Well, you know, th- this is a new area of study and um, it, linking hydration levels to brain health, uh, memory function. But what does seem to be the case is that as we get older, we uh, aren't as sensitive to cues to hydrate. So oftentimes uh, people are, are dehydrated and sometimes mistake thirst for hunger. So, um, you know, that's a, that's uh, a mistake I make a lot, I think. And then also yeah. the fact that many of us, as we age, perhaps have to take additional medicines, which can play into that too, right? I mean, we have to be a little careful. And again, with the advice of the doctor, which we're not advocating and, and sub- prescribing anything, but definitely you have to judge that and use your best judgment with oh, hydration yeah. and, and different medicines that you might be taking. Oh, correct, yeah. Okay. If you're just joining us, I'm Carolyn Donaldson. This is WPSU's Conversations Live. And tonight, we are talking with some experts about healthy aging. We are joining us tonight. We have uh, our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242. You can also send us questions by email at connect at wpsu.org. We've got Marty Slowinski and Amy Lorick from the Center for Healthy Aging and Mary Raffetto from the VA Van Zandt Medical Center. So once again, we did get an email question that I want to kind of talk about because I think it plays into some of the sociological um, aspects of healthy aging. So Joan, who is a personal friend of mine, I'm so glad, Joan, you brought this up because I see her out and about with her little one. Is there research on whether having a pet affects healthy aging? And if so, what are the possible conclusions? And does it matter what kind of pet it is? And if so, which kind is better? And she just thanks us in advance for having this program. So is it okay to have a pet? Is it good? Is it bad? How, how does that measure into healthy aging in today's equations? Amy, I'm going to ask you to start from your kind of psychological <laughs> and sociological hat. Well, I, um, I don't know what the research says on this, and maybe Marty could speak to that, but I do know that pets offer companionship and an opportunity to... Um, uh, to have a conversation, frankly, that's what we happens at our house. I have a conversation with my dog on a regular basis. Sure. Um, and so it's um, a, an outlet for um, expression, but also affection. And I think that is beneficial to us in terms of our mental health, but also in terms of just our staying engaged. Mm-hmm. And again, Through this pandemic, and we can get into more questions related to that, but we've seen that sense of community and that sense of loss and that sense of trying to find the right place. So, Marty, can you comment on the research Uh, behind some of this? It's a great question. It's very timely. I was just reviewing a brand new study that was published today. So the the research does suggest that owning certain pets, and I'll I'll give you uh, an idea of which kind you might be able to guess, um, are associated with better health um, in older age. There was just a study published looking at about 11,000 people in Japan. And what they found is that um, older adults who own dogs showed a lower likelihood of being physically frail, a lower likelihood of developing chronic health conditions. These are when people between the ages of 65 and 85 um, and a lower likelihood of developing disabilities. And this was even controlling for, they took into account it, you know, prior history of chronic illnesses, marital status, the amount of time they spent outdoors. So it really was owning dogs that seemed to be related to this good outcome. Unfortunately, um, owning cats didn't do the same same job. Now, I have a cat and a dog, so, um, but um, cat ownership was not associated with, with the better health outcomes. And, you know, part of the reason could be what Amy was saying. Um, also, uh, we think that it's, it's a reason to get out and move around. Mm-hmm. Um, I know during the pandemic, we have a dog, and the dog was the reason we would go for walks when the weather wasn't so great. So um, there are some direct benefits for that. Absolutely. Very interesting. Hey, we've got a caller, uh, Lisa from Bullsburg. Thank you so much for joining us on Conversations Live tonight. Your question for our panel of experts? Thank you so much. Um, 
I'm really interested in hearing the opinions of community-based care. Um, Pennsylvania has a community health choices program that is um, funded by the state, and I'm interested in hearing if there's any feedback on how well that program is working and if it's effective, but also to be talking about models of community-based care to work with individuals who may not be eligible for Medicaid um, to stay in their homes where there are systems that are set up to provide services to them that they may, for instance, buy into. Um, there are models like that in Massachusetts that I think are very interesting, and I'm wondering what these folks are thinking. So thank you. All right. Got a couple of questions within there. I'm going to just open it up. <laughs> Who would like to start the conversation on that? Well, you know, I'll start off probably not with, with the answer you're looking for. I don't know of research that has evaluated the um, effectiveness. I do know um, that, it, that they serve an important role in reaching underserved areas and people who can't otherwise um, have access to care. I think the emphasis on bringing care to people's homes is also important because it, it helps to serve and meet the needs of individuals who maintain autonomy and independence. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you find, Mary, when you serve some of the population base of the veterans who come in for their services? Um, again, largely home-based, I guess, and they come in for, for medical reasons or health reasons. But are you finding any any uh, variables out there with that, with that population? Well, we do have a home-based primary care program at the VA where we send the care to them, which is very nice. We have the providers, the dietitians, nurses, social workers actually visit the veterans in the homes, which is really helpful. And um, we have seen some positive health outcomes from that program. And we have some other programs as well where we can offer home health and different services if people can get out of the house a little bit, but they just need a little bit more assistance to help them age in place a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Age in place, aging in place. I guess that's, I, I did want to ask that. And Amy, I don't know if you can comment on that from a community's perspective. Is that something that we're still, especially younger caregivers looking at their moms or dads or the, you know, the, 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 people over a certain age, you know, this aging in place concept, is that still a, 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 a good thing for, for many folks? I, I think the research um, that, that I'm familiar with points to the fact that most people do want to stay in their homes as long as possible. And um, because of con community connections, because it's familiar setting, um, there are a variety of reasons that would drive that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that aging in place can mean many different things. And so it could mean that you get to stay and in the, your same community, in your same home. But it can also be that you choose a place at a certain age that you would like to live out the remainder of your, your life. And that's where you will stay then. So, so um, there are a variety of ways of interpreting aging in place. But I do know that... Um, many, most people are choosing to, to do that. It's also a little bit more economical for many people, and that could be one of the important variables mm -hmm. uh, that lead to that decision. But, um, but I also think that staying within one's community and the familiarity of your home makes a difference in terms of providing comfort and um, reassurance as so many other things are cha changing as you age. Okay. Very interesting. With, with your Center for Healthy Aging and the research that you've done, Marty, I, I'm curious to find, um, are you finding uh, different populations in the research that you've done have different healthier outcomes? Um, and is it based on cultures at all? Um, you know, again, I'm looking at multi-generational or intergenerational families that exist in certain cultures. Are, are we seeing that still helping in a healthy aging process for some? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll try and answer that by piggybacking on, on what Amy was talking about in terms of aging in place. Something to keep in mind is that not all communities are created equal when it comes to um, supporting healthy aging and, and keeping people autonomous and safe, um, living independently things to think about, um, where, the things we think about when we're younger or middle-aged, that where we pick where, we, where to live, um, aren't necessarily the things we should be thinking about 
when we're planning to where we want to live into older age. So thinking about things like access to transportation, walkability, sidewalks, um, access to sidewalks, all of those types of things um, we, we need to consider as well as um, the kinds of homes we live in. So living in a, a very nice uh, remote rural area when we're middle-aged is very, very different um, than when we're in our 70s or 80s. The home still may be nice, uh, the setting may be nice, but we may not have access to the services that we need. Mm -hmm. All right, good good point mm -hmm. again. Thank you. Hey, Dick from Johnstown joins us now on Conversations Live. Dick, your question tonight for our panel? Thank you. Yes, uh, I think all of us would agree that optimism is very important for healthy aging. and. Um, I was wondering, because as we get older, we think more of disease, acute and chronic, and also we think of death probably more often. So if um, how do we maintain optimism in light of these things, and how do we gain more optimism? I would appreciate your answer to that, and thank you. Thank you, Dick. That is something at any age we need to embrace. Right, Marty? Right, and that's a great question, Dick. And, um, you know, what's, what's kind of interesting, and the research does show that being able to maintain not only optimism, but positive views of aging and purpose in life um, are very much directly related to the quality of our life and, and how healthy we can stay into older age. And what's very interesting is that the research shows for people on average, as we get older, even you know when we have a little bit less time left, um, the stereotype that as we get older, we become less happy, uh, more depressed, isn't true on necessarily true on average that people um, are able to maintain happiness, uh, be able to manage stress, manage their anxieties uh, just as well when they get into older age. Now, there certainly are challenges that people face um, and complications that people need to deal with that um, are, you know, don't present uh, themselves in, 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 um, in younger years. Um, so I you know, want to acknowledge that as well. Um, one proven method for this is volunteerism. So, right. So, people who engage in, in in volunteerism show better outcomes into older age. And this isn't just about sort of feeling good, staying happy, staying engaged. Um, but there are some hard health outcomes, such as reduced likelihood of developing hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, strokes. Um, so, there are many, many benefits to. Um, uh, finding a place to volunteer. So if I could give one bit of advice, it would be to um, find places that you enjoy working at, um, volunteering at. Um, that sounds great. And I, I do want to ask Mary, because I'm pretty sure you've got a pretty vibrant volunteer network, right, at your VA hospitals and the clinics and the outpatient clinics. Yes, we do. We have quite a few uh, volunteers at the VA. Um, it, we have been allowing them to come back more and more now. I know for a while with COVID, we had to kind of put some things on hold, but they they love it. They love it. And mm -hmm. I worked on the CLC, the Community Living Center, for a while. That's our um, our skilled, we have some skilled nursing, some long-term care, some short-term rehab, kind of like a nursing home floor, more or less, just mm -hmm. to make it more understandable. And we used to have, when we could, we had volunteers come up all the time and it meant just as much to the volunteers as it did to the residents there. And it was, it was such a joy to see them interact. That's great. Amy, Amy um, would you be able to comment on like programs like OLLI, you know, as part of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute that's based here, but there are OLLIs all over the country, or, or something similar to that as also something that's good for healthy aging? Absolutely, and it sort of is an expansion of what Marty was talking about. There are RSVP programs, oh, yeah. That's right. uh, retired senior volunteer program, and that is really a, a service that helps place volunteers in the community with organizations that need help and need volunteers. Um, so there are some programs in other counties that are senior core or the foster grandparents yeah programs. These are active programs in um, counties across Pennsylvania that are just easy ways to find a way to just get involved sure. um, or are a resource that sure. can help you match 
to an organization of your interest. So it sort of takes all of the legwork out of doing the research and um, it makes it uh, easier to find uh, organizations that, that you're interested in or that might need help. Wonderful. And if I can give a blameless, selfish plug, WPSU uses a lot of volunteers for different things that we do right here. And we love the interaction that we get from our um, our more gray haired people that come in and help us with programs because they're knowledgeable and they've got these lifelong things that they've done. And they're, uh, they're vibrant people that want to give back to the community. So very good. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm Carolyn Donaldson. This is WPSU's Conversations Live. And tonight we're talking Talking about healthy aging. It's for everybody at all of our lifespans. Our toll free number is 1 800 543 8242. You can also send us some questions by email, and that's connect at wpsu.org. So you don't miss the program. You can just type in your question. We have we have still about a half hour left in the program, and we do have a gentleman who did write in to us. So let's get to his email here. Chuck from State College writes, what medical provider expectations related to aging should we have? And given the demographics, are providers attuned to the needs of seniors? Oh, boy. That's a that's a big one to answer, but who would like to start? <laughs> no one wants to. I'm, I'm going to put Marty on the spot then since you've got a little bit of the research there that you can probably tell us, generally speaking, we're not going to attack anyone individually or any doctors, of course. Yeah, I mean, so um, as, as people get, get older, just in the same way that they're pediatricians, that uh, are specialized in addressing the special needs that um, young people have. Um, it's important to recognize that some of the, the needs for being healthy and, and, and dietary needs might change as people get older. So it is important to have a doctor who's sensitive to what age their patient is, whether they're 20, 30, 40, 50, or 80. Uh, so I don't know that you always need a specialist but it is important for someone to take things like that into account and um, you know, be able to uh, make recommendations as, as needed, especially things uh, related to diet, uh, nutrition, exercise, and mental health, maintaining mental health in older age as well. Mm -hmm. And, and Mary, I guess you would see that firsthand with the demographics and the veterans that you work with and, and your providers, right, that work in unison with the dietitians that with including yourself, right, out there working with our veterans? Yes, yes. And I I feel that our providers are fantastic when it comes to that. And to touch on what Marty was saying, it is, it is you know, important to have a provider who really understands what is important for that individual and for their age. For example, you could look at somebody who is, I don't know, just, 90 years old, okay, they have diabetes, they have heart disease, textbook, you would say, okay, you want to cut back on XYZ and give them a whole list of things not to eat. However, if they're, if they're very thin, for example, maybe they're slightly undernourished, that wouldn't be the most practical advice to give them. Sure. So it sure. is very important to have somebody who really can take a step back and see the broad view of everything that's going on and make appropriate recommendations, not just textbook. There is a difference. Good, good point. And, and if I could just add one more point to that, sometimes um, is it, the, the relationship between a patient and a doctor is just that, uh, the, the relationship and it involves communication uh, going both ways. So it's also important um, that with your doctor that you don't minimize um, when you're talk, when if you have a difficulty or a problem, you don't minimize the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you share what's going on and kind of keep track of changes because sometimes um, changes that may creep up on us are something that if we catch them early, there's a lot you can do about them. Okay, we have another caller. Can we uh, get to that question for our panel of experts, Stephen from Dubois? You're on the phone right now. Can you uh, direct your question tonight? Thanks for joining oh, us. Oh yeah. Uh I'm a 91 years old, and I I'm, I live in a home, and I I have a arthritis all over my body, and how I can have a healthy living, you know? <laughs> how would you do it? How to be active? I mean, at your age, Stephen. First of all, I applaud you. You're 91 years young, right, folks? On our experts. Yeah, that's right. Yes, and I'm sorry. Your question. One more time. It was. 
with your arthritis, you're concerned about mobility or? Yeah, with a disease, you go to the doctor and it says, I can do nothing for you. You have a um, osteoporosis like and arthritis in your joints and I can do nothing for you. You're going to suffer for the rest of your life. <laughs> How wow. you can cope along with it. Oh, goodness. Well, yeah. who would like to offer some ideas? Um, you know, without knowing your situation, right, it, it's just, it's, it's very, and none of us are medical doctors, so we right. can't give you medical advice. Right? Thank you. <laughs> and, and, and without knowing your situation, it's hard to give you specific advice. But um, I know if a doctor said something like that to me, I, I want to talk to another doctor. Uh, because I, I do know that, um, you know, my mother had osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and um, through uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy was able to maximize their function, her, her function and her well-being and quality of life, um, even uh, when things got uh, uh, pretty bad. So mm -hmm. if you didn't like what your doctor said, there's nothing wrong with trying to, to talk to another one and see if they can come up with a better well, idea. I'm a no, but the only thing that I can find that out is a uh, uh, supplement doctor, like not a medication type, because my, the doc, my doctor said medication is going to get you hurt, hurt uh, worse than cure you. There's no mm. cure, but they just cope a lot with the pain. That's the problem. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, Stephen, we appreciate anyone else want to weigh in on that again we are these are um, research doctors and our dietitian but we feel you know and uh, overall we hope our program is a little bit enlightening to maybe offer some some relatable tips that you can take into the next step being optimistic and being out there in the in in as vibrant a community as you can be at this point thank you thank you very much um i do want to touch more on advocacy. So in this situation, perhaps even Stephen or, or someone, it, it, is it still good to have another caregiver, a family member, be an advocate for a person who is maybe, you know, having some cognitive issues or things like that? It, it, I, I hear about that and I'm going to ask my own doc, you know, daughter when it becomes evident that I need some help on, you know, learning the process and if I become ill in some way. So advocacy is, is a good thing, right, for family members to embrace in these aging circumstances? Absolutely. And I, I do want to sort of add something to what Stephen raised okay. as an issue. And, and that is that um, sometimes we are told to accept diagnoses or situations because we're just getting older. And I think that that's an easy out. Um, and, and I think that we have to begin to ask more questions and to ask for what science is teaching us because uh, gerontology, the area of geroscience is growing. And we are learning new things all the time. And so what a physician or a nurse may have learned in school may no longer be the right treatment. And it would be helpful to continue to ask questions to find out what the latest bit of information is that could be helpful. Very good. I and agree with Amy. And then just if I could, like, it sure. related to advocacy, there, there are some mm -hmm. um, useful resources that people can go to depending on what the, the, uh, uh, the situation is. So, you know, I, I would encourage people to visit um, the website for their area agency on aging. Um, there can be helpful resources there. Um, visiting the AARP website can direct to very uh, helpful resources for advocacy um, as well. And then um, uh, looking for your local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association um, can also provide uh, uh, some assistance and direction if you're looking for advocacy. And we've just put up your resources, too, just from our, our guests and panelists, and we'll have this information on our website following this as well as this program in full. So thank you for that insight. We have another caller, May from Belfont, is calling in tonight. Your question tonight, May, for our panel. Yes, thank you for taking the call. I wanted to know if there is any department for aging that uh, aid people to stay in their houses. You know, because to clean a house, to uh, even sometimes 
if you're ill, uh, it's very difficult to fix food and whatnot. I, did, I contacted the Department for Aging in Belfont, and the only information that they seem to have available, I contacted two people there, and they both wanted to send me the same information about uh, what to do if you don't have any money. There, evidently, there's no uh, real answer for people who want to stay in their house, are physically able to stay in their house, mm -hmm. and can afford to stay in their house, but may need help periodically, or maybe all the time. We're talking about 90-year-old people. Oh, yeah. Right. There are resources. Um, and so here locally at Center County, there's something called the Green Book. And the Green Book is something that the Area Agency on Aging, the Office of Aging, produces that lists all of the services and resources that you could find to do the kind of work you describe. And so each county does it a little differently. I know that Center County produces this as a resource and they are they don't evaluate the quality they just tell you the service that exists in our area and so that's a an immediate resource for you i contacted the department of aging in belfont and i didn't feel it was very helpful because all of their information was for people who uh had no no funds resources people talking to me yeah Mm -hmm. And I think that green book could be helpful to you uh, because it details all of the local businesses that do the work that you've you've described. And so I think that that it, that list might be a place to begin. And and if I could add, Mary, could you give us a little insight as to how the direction works for veterans and their families? Because that's a little more specific, right? The kind of resources you have for, for that population. Yes, yes. So if you do, if you can relate to what May is expressing and you're a veteran, then I would uh, suggest reaching out to the VA. Um, if you're currently a receiving benefits and you have a provider, reach out to your provider. Uh, we do have homemaking services. As far as eligibility and all of that, I, I don't know the details, but we do provide those types of services for homemaking a few hours a week, whether it be for cleaning, cooking, mm -hmm. all sorts of things. All right. And Marty, what, any any comments on that? Because again, that I, I, I know that uh, here's another statistic I, I was pulling out from your earlier discussion that we're living longer, which is wonderful, and therefore we need to have these services even expanded more greatly, right, within the government or in some quasi-governmental kind of thing mm -hmm. to be able to provide that type of resource information for folks? Yeah, you know, I, I would reiterate um, uh, the advice uh, suggestions Amy gave, but, but you know, that is a great point. And, and I wish that it was easier for people like me to be able to find the services that they need in this kind of situation. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, as a society, we spend a lot of money on helping young people grow up, but not so much um, attention on helping uh, people grow old. Um, so, this is a challenge that people face now mm -hmm. and more people will face in the future. And I have to applaud people like you, Marty, on the research end of things, because even with that new consortium you just found and you're going to get some funding for and do some research on, you're going to be able to show some maybe hard facts about how we do need to devote more time and energy to this important subject, right? The hope, the hope ultimately is to... Um, uh, create actionable science uh, where we can make uh, recommendations for policy um, that can impact people's lives. Absolutely. That's wonderful. That's great. Hey, I want to get back to some more common sense things while we have just we got about 15 minutes left and we didn't get through even all of the wonderful, positive, smaller changes that we can make. And Mary, I'm going to go back to you because you've brought some other graphics along that I don't want to get that point missed. We live in Pennsylvania. It's cold. It's dark right now. But we can do something about adding perhaps a supplement that will help us again. <laughs> Yes, yes. Let's talk about vitamin D. I see vitamin D deficiencies a lot. And this is across the board. This, this I do see it in the 
the population over 65, but I see it in younger people too. So vitamin D is called the sunshine vitamin. And the reason is because the sunshine can actually convert vitamin D in your body to its active form. So for most people, if you can spend 15 to 30 minutes a day out in the sun, you have your daily source of vitamin D, 100% of your recommended daily allowances. However, we live in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> As most of the viewing area does. And we know how little sun we get. And the, the other issue too is we also, we have a lot of cold months. So even when it's it might be sunny some days, it's still a little bit chilly. So we're not going out. Um, and in the summer when it's warmer, we're often wearing sunscreen, which blocks that. So here are a couple food sources of vitamin D that I wanted to share with you today. There really aren't too many fo uh, food sources of vitamin D, unfortunately, which is why we encourage sunlight as much as possible. And I wanted to share this with you. Um, Sockeye salmon is very high. Um, a lot of foods are fortified with vitamin D, such as dairy at milk, of course, is here. Um, orange juice isn't listed here, but that's another one. Some cereals, eggs is a good source as well. Um, and if you think that you may be a little bit low in vitamin D, or if you just, you know, you don't spend a lot of time outside and you think, hmm, maybe I should get this checked, do talk to your doctor and see if maybe a vitamin D supplement is right for you. What vitamin D is important for is for bone health. It helps with the uptake of calcium and it helps calcium and phosphorus to make the foundation of your bones. And after, the age of about 28, 29. So after about your late twenties, you stop building bone mass. Oh so, yeah. So it's very important to preserve the bones that you do have. So that's why I wanted to mention that today, because we do know that as you age, you are at higher risk for osteoporosis, osteopenia, all of those bone oh. disorders. All right. And while we're unhealthy, eating and also looking if you're still out grocery shopping or you're getting your groceries, looking at that label is very important, right? Right, Mary, you need to, to take a closer look at what is on that label. Yeah, so I wanted to touch on this briefly because this is a question that I get a lot and we hear a lot of concerns about how to read a nutrition label. So if we could uh, bring that up, I would like to there go over go. a few things with you. Thank you. So when you take a look at this label, it's very important that you look at the serving size and how many servings per container. So let's just hypothetically, let's say this is the bag of chips. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but a serving size is two thirds of a cup. Okay. And that's two thirds of a cup. There are 230 calories and there are 37 grams of total carbohydrates, three grams of protein. Now, most people will look at that and they'll think that's the amount for the entire bag. <laughs> and especially, yes, it happens so much. And if you're watching your sodium, if you have hypertension or congestive heart failure and you're watching your sodium intake, or if you're a diabetic and you're counting your carbohydrates and you want to stay within your recommended daily amount, it's very important to know how to read a nutrition label. On the other side too, while we're talking about carbohydrates, I do want to touch on this because I get this, com this uh, question a lot. If you are counting your carb carbohydrates, if you are diabetic, you want to look at the number of total carbohydrates, not just the total sugars, because it's the total amount of carbohydrates that is going to affect your blood sugar. It's not just the sugar itself, which I know can be a little misleading. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very interesting. Yeah. I, I know you're supposed to multiply that out by the servings, but I still want to eat all that whole bag when you get it sometimes, right? We have to be careful of that. Hey, we've got about um, just under 10 minutes left, and I do want to get to an email question that we have here. If we can bring that up, we have Amanda who has written in and asked, what type of health-related services are offered to do aging adults that are unable or easily can leave their home, including education groups or classes. So do we have those programs? And again, I guess we're generally speaking here, but mm -hmm. where can they seek some of these resources for, again, that cognition and that uh, better brain health, I guess? Marty, do you want to start or Amy? Well, I didn't know. Amy, did, did you have? I, I think um, 
one of the things to think about um, is that we've just come through a pandemic where most programs moved online. Yes. And so there are even more resources than ever before. And so that's good news uh, for, for those folks who are less mobile or less able to leave home. Uh, but it does mean connecting to the internet. Um, there, there may be other programs available through WPSU, mm -hmm. um, uh, which don't underestimate the power of, of those programs because there, there's a variety there as well. But um, that's something to consider is that there are more resources online than ever before. And there are some specific websites that we can share um, that might be helpful. But one of the most important ones might be uh, your local senior center. A senior center may be doing programming online right now. Um, I know se several in the area that are on YouTube or are uh, doing live stream exercise classes or just doing some interactional things to keep people socially connected. So, so that's my first attempt at that question, but I know Marty had some things to add. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, Amy is right to get um, s some of these um, high quality educational programs having access to the internet is important. Um, Ollie has been offering online courses. So a shout out for Ollie. Absolutely. We have one of the best check out um, our um, Ollie organization as well as others. Um, and if you're very ambitious, AARP um, on their website has um, opportunities for continuing education. Uh, courses as well. So the two places I would look is in Ali and um, AARP. All right. And I also want to include Mary in this because Mary, you brought along some video of a healthy kitchen exercise that you're doing in person, but also offering online. Do you want to walk us through what we'll see here? Yes, yes. So we have several nutrition classes, actually, and they're all offered virtually right now. Um, they're offered through the VA's version of Zoom. Um, but this is our Healthy Teaching Kitchen, and we offer these classes monthly. And we have a new series starting up uh, next week, and it will be a six-week series. If you're interested, please give us a call. So this is Megan. She's one of our dietitians, and she is making a mango salsa. And in these classes, we not only teach how to cook, or we don't not only teach healthy recipes, but we teach proper Proper, proper cooking procedures. So how to use a knife, how to, as you saw, peel a mango. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about food safety and we talk about just really basic things that not everybody knows. And sometimes we will, well, actually oftentimes we will make it a little bit more disease specific or we'll um, give people some ideas. So we'll say, if you're diabetic and you don't wanna use this, you can use this. If you're cutting out sodium, this is what you can do. If you're gluten-free, substitute this for this. And it really helps to take a lot of the guesswork out. And anybody who participates in our series, we give them a cookbook too. So that really helps a lot. That's wonderful. I guess, again, a, a positive as as best we can call it, positive outcome of the pandemic is the connectedness that we have been able to make through online things. And I can't underestimate for my own personal life, you know, the effectiveness of a, a FaceTime call with my grandkids, right? I mean, um, if those capabilities are available, does that help, Marty, with connectivity and keeping us in a healthy aging process to be able to connect with our own community, our own loved ones, you know, through our phones that we all carry now and uh, they have iPads and those kind of things. So that's a great question. Staying socially connected is one of the pillars of brain health. So uh, number one, staying socially connected is very important. The research is not yet in as to whether or not the virtual connections uh, do the same trick. But um, certainly they're very important um, to serving a social and, and um, you know, emotional well-being function to keep people talking to each other when they otherwise couldn't. All right. We've only got about three minutes left, so I'm going to wrap this up by asking each of our wonderful panelists tonight, and thank you so much, to just summarize maybe one takeaway that our folks that are watching, that are listening tonight can come away and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to be more conscious of having that healthy aging lifestyle that we're advocating here tonight. And I'm going to start with Amy. Let's start with Amy on that. 
Well, that's easy, Carolyn. It's the learn new things. Uh, find a way to be curious about the world around you or people around you um, to continue to learn new things um, that helps us with our brain health. Perfect. Great. Mary, I'm going to go to you next. <laughs> I would just like to reiterate to eat for health, uh, try new foods, eating healthy does not have to be boring, and be proactive with your nutrition, not reactive. All right. And Marty, as the kind of research expert on this, you've got a, just under two minutes here. Give us a recap of what you think our takeaway is for all of us to embrace this healthy aging lifestyle that we're talking about tonight. Oh boy, if, I guess if there is one take home message, it would be that it's never too late to make good choices. And sometimes it's always better to, um, uh, prevention is, is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but um, at any point in time, making good choices can have an impact. And one thing we didn't, we didn't talk about um, that I just wanted to um, uh, mention at the end is um, the importance of being able to stay socially connected. And to do that, you have to be able to hear what people are saying. And um, there's exciting new research, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it in the future, that if you do have a hearing problem, getting a hearing aid can help boost your brain function and prevent um, the onset of dementia. That's amazing. And that is something that I know personally has made a big difference in my own life. So you folks have been amazing with some of your insight, your knowledge and resources. And we can't thank you enough. So Marty Slowinski, the Center for Healthy Aging at Penn State, Amy Lorick, also with the Center uh, for Healthy Aging and Mary Raffetto from the VA Van Zandt Medical Center. Thank you so much for talking with us. We greatly appreciate it. Of course, the resources that you've heard about tonight will have available on our website and and also a recap of this program will be available down the road. So we look for you to continue to engage in your communities. Thank you so much for joining us in our next episode of Conversations Live will be coming up March 17th. Again, get your brain thinking about this one, folks, for all ages. It's Pennsylvania's redistricting. There's a lot that we can think about. Thank you for watching, listening to WPSU's Conversations Live. We hope you have a safe evening. Be careful out there and thanks again.